Hello and welcome to Happier, a podcast where we talk about ways to become happier. This week, we'll talk about an easy way to find the perfect gift for someone, and we'll do a deep dive into the very helpful answers we received to a listener's question about how to handle her father's final days. I'm Gretchen Rubin, a writer who studies happiness, the five senses, human nature. I'm in a little cobbled together makeshift studio that I have made in a hotel room in San Francisco. And joining me today from LA and the Pacific time zone, it's nice to be in the same time zone, Mm -hmm. Elizabeth, is my sister, Elizabeth Kraft. My sister, the retreat host, Elizabeth, how was it? That's me, Elizabeth Kraft, a TV writer and producer living in LA. And Gretchen, the retreat was fantastic. We had so much fun. And now Sarah and I are busy, busy coming up with all all sorts of different retreats we might do. We had (laughs) such a great time. We loved it so much. We just want to dive into retreats. A whole new adventure. Yes. Love the community. A few updates before we start in. We got so many positive comments about the Clear the Decks, that oddball episode that we did in 443, where it was a bunch of very brief things to do to clear off things off your to-do list. And many people asked us to do it again. And so we are doing a Deck the Halls Clear the Deck. So it will be holiday-related. We will do that in an upcoming episode of More Happier. As somebody pointed out, Deck the Halls has deck, so it's clear the decks and deck the hall. Uh, But Kayla pointed out that even if you don't celebrate Christmas and deck the halls, it's December, if you mispronounce Ah. December. So there's a deck (laughs) in there either way. And of course, the first Clear the Decks episode is something you could do at any time, and you could do it many, many times. So you might want to go back and do that if it caught your fancy the first time. That was episode 443. Anytime you want to clear the decks to gear up or get ready for a change or challenge. I'm excited for that episode. Yeah. If you want the original Clear the Decks list in written form, you can get that at GretchenRubin.com slash resources. And also, Gretchen, want to remind everybody that for Diabetes Awareness Month, we are going to do an episode all about type 1 diabetes. So if you have any questions about it, send them in and we will answer them. Also, this is sort of odd, but if you've requested book plates and they haven't arrived, my neighborhood has been experiencing mail theft, Mm. which I didn't really know was a thing, but it is a thing. They have caught a ring of mail thieves, but if your book plates haven't arrived, that perhaps is why. So again, if you want to request again, or if you want to request them for the first time, of course, feel free to request as many as you like. Go to happiercast.com slash bookplate. This is for U.S. and Canada only. And I am very sorry if your book plate has gone missing. Hopefully this problem has been solved. Elizabeth, this week our Try This at Home tip is to take my new gift-giving quiz. I'm so excited to unveil this. So what is it, Gretchen? I know you love a quiz. I love taking yeah. your quizzes. What is the yeah. gift-giving quiz? Yeah, well, when I was writing Life in Five Senses, it kind of reminded me of Better Than Before because when I was thinking so much about habits, I started to pick up differences in how people approached the idea of habits, what worked for them, what they liked, what they were drawn to, what they didn't like. And over time, I figured out the four tendencies, how that was a framework that divided how people thought about things. And same thing when I was writing Life in Five Senses. And I could pick up that there were these distinctions in people's attitudes. It's very hard to find something if you don't know what you're looking for. And so, Elizabeth, I probably talked to you about Mm. this on and off for years. It was like, is it discernment? Is it high standards? I was trying, I was sort of groping my way through it. And then in the end, what it turned out was that it had nothing to do really with the five senses, except indirectly, and that a lot of times, you know, gifts satisfy our senses. It had to do with how people felt about basically getting gifts, the kind of gifts they like to receive. And so once I had that epiphany, then it very quickly fell into place. Mm, So what kinds of questions? What I realized is that when it comes to happiness, it is so satisfying to find that perfect gift. Elizabeth, you know this. You love to give the perfect gift. We all know how 
gratifying that is. But then it is also frustrating when you don't have any ideas about what to give. Yes. Or you give an unsuccessful gift where you're really excited about a gift, but then you can tell that the recipient really isn't that enthusiastic about it, even if they say they are. And then there are all kinds of questions like, well, what if I splurge? Will the recipient even care? Like, is it worth splurging? Or like, what if they've requested something specific and I can't find it? Can I make a reasonable substitute or really is the person going to not want it? Wow. Do you give the same item year after year or is that just laziness? Should you try to be imaginative or is this just going to end up in the re-gifting or donating pile if you try to think outside the box? So this quiz makes all of those things clear. Mm, I cannot wait to take the quiz. What are the types, Scratch? Because I know you usually have types. Yes. Okay. So this is an interesting quiz because, you know, usually when you take a quiz, you answer it for yourself. But here right. you're answering with the recipient in mind. So you're thinking, oh, what am I going to get my father for Christmas? So that you, you think it asks you questions about patterns that you've detected in their behavior in the past. You know, because what we often do is we give the kinds of gifts we like to receive, which is very well-intentioned, but often isn't a good match because the person might be different. That's how I got to the pet egg, Gretch. Remember That's I how you got to the pet for myself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. The most famous gift-giving yeah. episode in the Happier Podcast history. So the categories are easy to please, tried and true, enthusiast, and connoisseur. And so you take the quiz with the person in mind, and at the end, you get the result, and you get a kind of gift appreciation profile to explain the kinds of things that tend to work. And then there's some guidance and some specific ideas. And then you also, I'm um, just threw in for fun, you get a free downloadable gift planning worksheet where you can note people's names and ideas as you think of them as you're starting to gather your ideas for gift giving Ooh, for the holidays. Nice. That is awesome. I cannot wait for this. Yeah. So it's at GretchenRubin.com slash quiz. It's free. It's short. It's fun. Tell me what you think. I'm so excited to hear what people make of this. It was really hard to do it. It was very hard, and then it was very easy. Once the central insight, then it all fell into place very quickly. So I'm excited to hear what people think. Well, it's perfect timing because I am just about to start earnestly shopping for the holidays. So. Well, listen, the, you are so good about that. You are so good about starting in advance. You always inspire me. Well, I've been caught too many times late, <laughs> and, and we, I we've just all done don't want to be there again. <laughs> All right, Gretch, coming up, we have a repeat happiness hack because it's just that important of a hack. But first, this break. Okay, Gretch, we're back with a happiness hack. And this is one that we've done before. Yes, and I wanted to repeat this hack because a friend of mine just relearned this lesson the hard way because she left her phone in a taxi. And the hack is always look behind you when you leave. If you get up from your seat in a restaurant, if you're leaving a car, if you're walking out of a friend's house, you're leaving the office, whatever you're doing, have it be a habit that you just glance behind you. And I cannot say how many times I've done this, and I was so grateful that I remembered, and the times when I forgot, when I regretted it, and I thought I wouldn't have had to go back for that sweater that I left if I had just glanced behind me and seen that it was hanging on the back of my chair. So we don't yep. need to belabor it. Just try to be in that habit and do it consistently, and you will not regret it. Yes. That bears repeating. Yes. And now for a deep dive into listeners' answers. In episode 451, we shared a listener's question for suggestions about dealing with the fact that her father had been diagnosed with cancer that is not treatable. She asks, for those who have lost a loved one, what advice do they have? How do I spend this time wisely and prevent regrets when he is gone? And Gretchen, people had so many great suggestions, yes. largely based on their own experience, yes. also a lot of resources to suggest. Yes. So this is very practical and very thoughtful. Rebecca said, when my beloved grandfather, as well as my uncle, were dying in the same year, I asked them for a book they loved. My grandfather gave me his copy of Leaves of Grass, while my uncle gave me a stack of books on spirituality that made a big impression on him. They both died shortly after. They were both readers who marked their books, and seeing what they underlined or wrote in the margins was a wonderful way to connect with them for years. However, I wish I had asked them this earlier so I could have had the books and discussed them while they were alive. Mm. Also from a Rebecca, 
She says, two years ago, my little brother died of brain cancer. He was 53. Consider an anti-anxiety medication. My doctor prescribed Zoloft, and that helped. Your dad has shared that he wants to be treated, quote, normally, and I would absolutely respect those wishes. He may not want heartfelt conversations, and that is okay. Simply being available will speak volumes. Perhaps you can still help make sure he sees family members, friends, and colleagues that he especially enjoys. No one needs to know about his health status. After my brother died, I attended a grief class based on the book Understanding Your Grief by Alan D. Wolfelt, Ph.D. I found myself wishing I had read the book before the loss. If there comes a time when your father does want to share his condition, consider Caring Bridge. That was an invaluable tool for our family. Yeah, Caring Bridge is a site that allows you to post personal health journals to keep friends and family updated easily. So if you feel like you're inundated with people's loving questions, this is a way that everybody can stay in the loop in a very efficient way so that people feel like they know what's going on, but nobody has to spend a lot of time answering their questions. Yes. Annette said, I lost my dad. He, too, was not too talkative and didn't want people fussing over him. I also lived 1.5 hours away, was working, and had kids at home. Between visits, I called him on a fairly regular schedule, generally midweek and Sunday mornings. As I thought of them, I kept a list of cherished or funny family memories and, as often as possible, worked it into a conversation to communicate how special those times were. Sometimes he was tired and I let it be. Sometimes I framed it as a question, as though I didn't remember and he would expand on it. I also wrote him a long letter expressing how I felt, because I knew doing it verbally would make him uncomfortable. This I gave to him when he had about two to three months expected time left. I found it in his bedside drawer after he passed, evidently read multiple times. Oh, that's nice. Lindsay says, a resource that was shared with me when we first learned of my mom's diagnosis was called the ring theory, and I found it super helpful. More or less, it means that the person most affected by an experience is at the center of the map. They can do, say, feel anything they please because they're, well, the most impacted. Those closest to them form the next ring of support, and they can do, say, feel, or dump anything they please onto those further away from the support center, but they must be careful to not dump in to those closer to the center than they are. This model of care, comfort in, dump out, allows for each person to give and get support from the appropriate resources. I've heard of this, Gretchen, and I think it's a, it's a really good model. You're very helpful. Julie wrote, I lost my mom in January. Although I fully agree that being present with your loved one is important, I also asked myself, what would my future self want? Inspired by a Gretchen Know Yourself Better question. Birthdays are big in our family, and I felt overwhelmed thinking about her not being there to celebrate with in the future. I recorded her singing Happy Birthday on a voice note on my phone, and that makes the first birthday I will have without her in a few weeks feel less daunting. I think this also includes thinking about anything you don't want to leave unsaid to your loved ones. I created connection rituals to have as many touch points during the day as I could when I was away. FaceTiming every day, sending snail mail, setting up a digital picture frame where I could send pictures straight to the frame so she could feel like she was part of my life despite the distance. Skylight is great for this, though a bit pricey. It's a good gift to split among other loved ones who may want to also send instant photos. My mom had severe cognitive deficits that came on quickly, and I wish I could have asked questions about childhood and so many things. I use StoryWorth, a service that sends prompts and records questions and then compiles them for my dad a long time ago, but never did one for my mom and so wish I had. I cannot stress this enough. Get wills, estates, financial planning in order if they aren't already. I wish we had involved hospice sooner. They can help with so many things. More therapy dogs. My mom loved animals, and having therapy dogs visit was a huge highlight for her. I just want to stress StoryWorth and Skylight are great, Gretchen. I use both of those. Yeah. Kelly said, if there is something special that you and your father shared, remember that. Bring it up with him or just hold it close. My father and I love the ocean. When I miss him, I go there, sit, and feel near him. Kimberly said, My advice is to assume you have less time than you think. 
Don't be shy about what you love and have appreciated about them while they can still hear it. I did not expect our last lucid visit to be the last lucid visit because he was still telling bad dad jokes up to the end, and I wish I had showered him with more praise. Mm-hmm. Ashley said, take pictures with him and then him and the kids. I realized too late I was only taking pictures of him and the kids, so there's almost nothing with him and me for years. Mm. Speaking of photographs, Alex said, I'm a photographer and naturally a very visual person, but I discovered through What's Your Neglected Sense quiz that my neglected sense is hearing. After losing my two grandfathers, I have loved going through photos of them, but I miss their voices so much. What I would give for quick little videos of my grandfathers. Now, whenever I'm with my grandmothers, I take short videos and make voice recordings on my voice memos app. Mm, That's a good idea. Mm Mm-hmm. Catherine said, after losing my mother, I feel that the most important thing is for her to capture her father's stories. His ancestors, where is his family from? What does he remember about his grandparents and aunts and uncles? His life, what are the key memories of his childhood? What are the proudest moments of his life? His life with you, what does he remember about your birth? What are his favorite memories of your time together? His possessions, are there special items to him? What is the story behind them? My mother loved her jewelry, and we went through each piece and recorded when and where she got it, why she chose it, and when she wore it. Write it all down. I thought I would remember everything my mom told me about, but the emotion of the time makes the memories hazy. Mm, Good point. Sarah said, number one suggestion, honor his wishes. He doesn't want anyone to know. Don't tell people. Shelby said, I'm a grief coach and author, and I recommend several tools to clients. Help Text is a super affordable service, less than $100 a year, that texts practical expert advice from hospice nurses, therapists, mindfulness practitioners, and end-of-life experts a couple of times a week. Texts are customized based on your unique situation, so Jen could opt to receive texts about caring for her father with cancer and she lives far away. The Death Deck and the End of Life Deck are clever, even fun card games that ask mindful questions about end of life, such as, what would I do with my social media pages? Do I want a party or a memorial when I die? If I could send a message from the beyond, how would my family and friends know it's me? You can play one or two cards at a time to spark discussion or take turns having everyone answer a different card. This can help you feel closer to your loved one and also get a sense of what a good death would mean for them. For estate planning and documents, the website Get Your Sh- together is super helpful. It contains guidance plus free downloadable cheat sheets for handling the logistics of a loved one's death. Heather wrote, I lost my dad and I wish before he got sick, I had had a chance to read Atul Gawande's wonderful book, Being Mortal, which explores many of the big questions about end-of-life decisions, drawing on his experience as a doctor and his own personal experience of losing his father. The book is practical and memorable and, in its graceful handling of the material, comforting. One other thought. Try to find levity together. When my father was in the hospital, I was in serious mode, telling him how much I loved him, thinking back over his life and how much his love had shaped me. But when my mom would visit, she would joke around with him, commenting on how he had rock star hair, i.e. messy from the medical equipment, and I would see him light up when he laughed with her. Hmm. Gretch, I also just wanted to mention an amazing book by a friend of mine, Colin Campbell. Yes. He wrote a book called Finding the Words, Working Through Profound Loss with Hope and Purpose. His two children, Ruby and Hart, were killed in a drunk driving accident, and he has written an incredible book that will help anybody dealing with grief. Yeah. Well, this is so helpful. These are so practical. We will provide links to all the resources that were mentioned. So if you didn't quite catch it, uh, don't worry. You can just look in the show notes. This is episode 454. And just go to happiercast.com slash 454. And I really think it's great that listeners did have so many practical suggestions that really did come from deep, deep experience because 
this is one of the best examples of how we can all learn from each other because sometimes one person's suggestion can really lighten the load um, at a difficult time. And so thank you everyone who took the time to write in to help other people benefit from your own sorrow and difficult experiences. Yes, thank you to everyone. Amazing suggestions. And coming up, I have a happiness demerit. But first, this break. Okay, Elizabeth, it's time for demerits and gold stars. And this is an even-numbered episode, which means it's your turn to talk about a demerit. Yes. So, Gretchen, this might sound familiar to anybody (laughs) who listened to last week's episode, because my demerit this week is the exact same as your demerit from last (laughs) week, which is that... I didn't take enough photos. Mm. I, Sarah and I, as we mentioned at the top of the podcast, um, had our amazing writer's retreat in Ojai at the Johnny Cash Ranch last weekend. Yes. And we walked in the house, and it, it, it was so incredible and fun. The decor was amazing. I said to Sarah, just so you know, I'm taking a ton of pictures. Yeah. I'm taking videos. Prepare yourself. Yeah. And then I proceeded to take, like, two <laughs> pictures because, as we discussed, I was so in the moment. I didn't want to stop and take photos. I didn't want to stop conversation. I was having too much fun. Luckily, we did have someone there who's a director, and I think directors naturally take a lot of pictures. So she has shared a document um, with me that has a bunch of pictures. Yeah, But it's just one of those things. I wish I had a ton of pictures. Well, I have a couple thoughts. One is, it's nice that somebody else is taking pictures because then you're in them. Because one of the things that happens if you do take a lot of photographs is you're not in them. And it is fun to be in at least some of the pictures. But here's what occurs to me. Because you're right, you get drawn into it and you forget about it, even though you then regret it. So maybe one thing to do is to sort of announce to the group or even just yourself to say, I am the photographer. I am the one who is assuming that role. So then you, it's that outer accountability and just sort of saying to yourself, reminding yourself of that identity. I remember, Lisa, when we had that double birthday party for our father and my father-in-law, I said to everyone, I'm the photographer. I'm going to be taking pictures and so cooperate yes. if I want to take your picture. And then everybody knew. They would say to me like, oh, did you get a picture of this? Did you get a picture of that? It was a pain. But it really kept me on track. And so that was that. But that was a lot of responsibility. So I could even imagine, say, with you and Sarah, you could say, today I'm the photographer, tomorrow you're the photographer. That would be a good idea. Yes. And then it's, it's not so burdensome, but then you even feel more responsibility because you want to do your part. And then you're in yeah. some of the photographs. And so maybe it's just now that we both have given this demerit, we should think about yes. how we could set ourselves up for success. Yes. Good idea. Okay, Gretchen, what is your gold star? I give a gold star to doctors and scientists because I got my double vax in one day, one arm for the flu, one arm for COVID. Got it all done. Felt great. So happy to have that behind me. And then Jamie... I will say that in years past, Jamie has been somewhat inconsistent with his flu shot because mm-hmm. he's like, oh, I never get sick. And then he will get sick and then he grouses. But this year he got it too. Just yesterday he got it. So I want to say thank you to all the doctors and scientists who have made this available. I feel so fortunate whenever I get to avail myself of that science. Yeah. And Gretchen, inspired by you, I went and got my double vax. I went for the one arm. I got both of them in Ooh. my right arm. because Oh, interesting. Lefty. Ah. And I feel so good about myself. They didn't even give me that option. Oh, interesting. Yeah, who knows? The resource for this week, take the gift guide quiz. I'm so eager to hear what people think of it. If it unlocks some gift realizations for you, let me know. I'm really excited to put it out into the world. And that is just at GretchenRubin.com slash quiz, like all the quizzes. Elizabeth, what are we reading? What are you reading? I am reading Easy Money by Ben McKenzie and Jacob Silverman. And I am reading Chain Gang All-Stars by Nana Kwame Eje Brenya. And that's it for this episode of Happier. Remember to try this at home. Take the new gift-giving quiz. Let us know if you tried it, if it worked for you, what you learned about your gift recipient. Thanks to our executive producer, Chuck Reed, and everyone at Cadence 13. Get in touch. Gretchen's on Instagram and TikTok and threads at Gretchen Rubin. And I'm on threads and Instagram at Liz Craft. Our email address is podcast at GretchenRubin.com. And if you're wondering what gift we would appreciate getting, it is the gift of your follow, rating, reviewing, 
following or recommending us to a friend, you know how much we appreciate that. Until next week, I'm Elizabeth Kraft. And I'm Gretchen Rubin. Thanks for joining us Onward and Upward. Gretchen, I'm dying to know, did your friend get her phone back from the taxi? She did, and faster than you would think. So it all ended up being okay, but it was a panicky time, as you can imagine. And I I do not think that she will be doing that again soon. But Alyssa, you know, we wear the bandolier, so you've got your phone around your neck. So Absolutely, but I've been there with Adam in San Francisco, as a matter of fact. He left his phone in an Uber, and that was an odyssey to get it back, but we did. Yeah. Yeah, but there's the sweater, there's yeah. the sunglasses, there, there, so the, many the lost AirPods. items. Yeah, so many lost items. From the Onward Project.